Hey everyone, this is Troy Black. So I want to talk about unity in the body of Christ today, and I want to specifically answer the question, what is the bond of peace? That, that term, you may have heard that term, that phrase before, the bond of peace. So I'm going to talk about what that is exactly, and then I'm also going to talk about how we can maintain the unity that God wants us to, to maintain as believers in Christ. Uh, I'm going to start by reading a verse from Ephesians chapter 4. And this is a verse that you've probably heard before if you've ever heard teaching on unity. Um, but, but I'm also going to go back to Ephesians chapter 2 in a couple minutes. Okay, so Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. This is Paul the Apostle talking. Verse 2 says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And, and that, that phrase right there, the bond of peace, what I want to talk about today is how that phrase actually has a spiritual definition behind it and how Paul gives us God's intention um, for having him use that phrase. So I want to answer this question, what is the bond of peace? And to do that, I'm first going to look at some of the things that fight against the bond of peace and that fight against unity in the body of Christ. So skipping ahead to verses 25 through 27, Paul says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So he's saying, don't lie to each other because that causes disunity. And then verse 26, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Again, he's saying, don't stay angry at one another and don't let that anger turn into bitterness because it's going to cause disunity. Verse 27, <clears throat> do not give the devil an opportunity. And then I'm skipping ahead to verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So these, these things that Paul is talking about in these verses are, are all these things that fight against unity. I mean, because it, you can imagine it would be hard to be unified with someone if you're, if you're constantly angry at them or if you can't forgive them or if you're resentful toward them or bitter at them. And I think this list is very important because we can always watch out for these things and say, am I not forgiving uh, my brother or my sister in Christ? Or am I being uh, resentful or bitter towards them? And, and if, if the Holy Spirit is convicting us of that, then we can, we can turn away from that. We can receive grace. Um, so it's so important to be aware of these things. But I honestly believe that God is more concerned with us being proactive about building unity than He is with us trying to, uh, to fight against these things. And the reason I believe that is because if we as believers are proactively building unity with one another, these things aren't even going to be an issue for us. So at the end of this passage in verse 32, I believe that Paul gives us the key to finding the answer to our question, what is the bond of peace? And I'm going to read verse 32 again. It says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So I truly believe that forgiveness is the key. So I'm going to look at a verse in Matthew, um, and this, these are the words of Jesus. He's just finished telling this parable about forgiveness, um, and then this is what he says. This is how he finishes it. Matthew 6, 15. He says, But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. And transgressions are just our, our sins one against another. I have a really hard time with this verse sometimes, to be honest with you. I'll read this verse, and, and I always kind of have, and I've always wondered, God, this sounds so harsh to me, to be honest. Like, I'm just being 100% just being honest right now. It sounds incredibly harsh because I'm thinking, if I've been forgiven, you know, because of the grace of God, but then I mess up and I hold unforgiveness toward a, a brother or sister in Christ in my heart, is God not going to forgive my sins because of that? But I believe Jesus said this for a reason. I don't think he's being harsh here. I think he's being real. Um, and I want to show you why he said this. So I'm going to go back to Ephesians, and now I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 2, because I believe that when Paul, when Paul talks about the bond of peace in Ephesians chapter 4, he's not introducing it then. He actually introduces it and defines it in chapter 2. And then he's just reaffirming it in, in chapter 4. Verse 11 says, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by the so-called circumcision, 
which is performed in the flesh by human hands. The, the circumcision was a sign for the, the Jews in the Old Testament um, who were following the Old Covenant. It was a sign that they were the people of God. And the Gentiles, when they were living um, by their standards in their own way, they didn't have that sign. They were not even a part of the law of God. And they weren't considered the children of God. The Old Testament does make room for, uh, for, for foreigners and for outsiders and for Gentiles to come in and to actually receive the promises of God if they will follow His ways. But the important thing to note is that the Jews, they were born into a society and they were born into a people group um, who were supposed to be following God's laws um, by default. So Paul is making this distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. And when the new covenant hap- occurred, when God sent Jesus to the earth, when he died, he rose again, and then uh, he ascended back into heaven. The, the Jews that received him and, and who were saved, they had a hard time sharing this message with the Gentiles because they had always been taught, we are the children of God and they are not. But God's plan was that through Jesus Christ, the message of the gospel would go to the entire world and that every single person would be able to receive it and would have hope when they received the truth of the gospel. So moving on to verse 12, remember that you were at the same time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, he's talking to the Gentiles still, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So he's saying At one time you had no hope, but now because of the message that is being preached, you have hope in Jesus Christ. And and the reason Paul is talking about this is because there was so much disunity between the Jews and the Gentiles because the Jews had for so long been the chosen people of God and the Gentiles had not. But he's saying, he's talking about this because he's saying God has unified both groups in Christ Jesus. So verse 14 says, for he himself is our peace. And that's talking about Jesus. Jesus is our peace who made both groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. And enmity just means uh, hostility. Um, It's talking about, it means opposing something. And and enmity fights against unity. Uh, By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which in the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Verse 16, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. So in the ESV, um, verse 16, um, I'm going to read this. It's really cool. The ESV actually says verse 16 16 like this. It says, he killed the hostility. And I love that because because the hostility is what Satan was using to divide these two groups of people. And the very thing that the devil was using to kill the unity, Jesus killed on the cross. He killed the hostility. So let's look at exactly how he did that. Verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. What that means is, Preaching peace is talking about the message of the gospel. Verse 18, For through Him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So he's saying that Jesus, through the message of the gospel, through the work that He did on the cross, brought peace to both groups of people. And in fact, He himself became the peace between both groups of people. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So, What's so amazing about this is, I know this whole time I've been talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, that's, what, that's who Paul is addressing is the Gentiles and saying, now you are made one uh, through the body of Christ with the Jews, with the people of God. You are all the people of God who have received the message. This is what's so amazing, amazing about this is, we, can, we don't just have to apply this to the Jews and Gentiles, we get to apply it to ourselves as well. And the reason is because in verse 21, it says, in whom the whole 
structure. He's talking about every single part of the body of Christ, every believer in Jesus Christ, which means if, if you're a believer, then he's talking about you and he's talking about me. And the reason this is so important is because the, this is actually answering that question, what is the bond of peace? The bond of peace is really simple. Jesus brought peace. He became the peace between the Jews and the Gentiles. And he also became the peace between every single believer. And the way he did that is when we, through the Spirit of God, enter the body of Christ, we all become one in Christ. We all become unified in Christ. And this is really cool. I don't want you to miss this. Uh, Verse 15, it says, By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the way he abolished the enmity or the way he killed the hostility, it says, in his flesh. And the very first time I read this, I thought, what on earth does that mean? Like, it's like, it seems like Jesus would be walking in the Spirit, right? But it's not talking about Uh, necessarily walking in the spirit versus walking in the flesh. What it's talking about is it's talking about his literal fleshly body. Jesus, in a sense, he traded his fleshly body on the cross for a spiritual body, the body of Christ. And so because of that, because of what Jesus did on the cross, the unity that exists in the body of Christ is directly connected to the death of Christ on the cross. And the reason Jesus was willing to make that trade, it's the same same reason he came to the earth in the first place. It's because God loved us so much. It's because we, as as people who rejected um, the rule of God, who, who sinned against God, we were going to spend an eternity separate from God. But because of God's love for us, because of the love that Jesus had for us, because of his obedience to the Father, he was willing to make a trade his fleshly body while he was on earth for the spiritual body of Christ. And the reason is because he was bringing us back into fellowship with the Father. And that is what uh, verse 22 actually says. It says, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. When we are unified as believers in Christ, when we become the body of Christ, God actually dwells in our midst. He dwells in the body of Christ, which means in all of us and between us. So what's the big problem with unforgiveness and and all disunity? The big problem with it is that you can't hold on to both at the same time. We only can receive our own forgiveness through what Jesus did for us on the cross. But when we choose not to forgive our brother or sister in Christ and we hold on to that unforgiveness, what we're saying to God is we're saying, God, I'm receiving your forgiveness because of what Jesus did on the cross, because I deserve to be forgiven. But they don't deserve to be forgiven. So I'm not going to turn around and give that same forgiveness to somebody else. But here's the truth that we're missing. None of us deserve to be forgiven. God loved us so much despite our sin, despite how unworthy we were that He sent Jesus to to live a perfect life and to be the perfect sacrifice for us. But we cannot, we can't take that in parts. We can't say, I'll just take a little bit of that. I'll take enough for myself. That's what we're doing. When we're not, when we're choosing not to forgive someone else, we're trying to hold on to the cross of, of Christ. We're trying to hold on to what he's done for us on the cross while at the same time, not letting our brother also hold on to it. But we cannot hold on to both at the same time. We can't grasp the cross and unforgiveness at the same time. And that's why Jesus made the bold statement that if we do not forgive our brother or our sister in Christ, that God will not forgive us. And the second huge problem with, uh, with unforgiveness and with disunity is that when we reject forgiveness, when we reject unity, we also reject Jesus himself. And I'll show you, I'll show you where uh, it says this in Scripture. Verse 14 says, He himself is our peace. So if we are rejecting peace between us and other believers who together we form the body of Christ, we're rejecting the body of Christ himself. And if there's no peace between us, then there's no Jesus in our midst. And if this sounds harsh right now, I need you to understand I'm not trying to say this judgmentally at all because I need to hear this just as much as anyone. 
But it's so important to understand that holding on to the cross of Christ requires us to let go of disunity, to let go of unforgiveness. If you're holding on to unforgiveness or bitterness or, or anger or resentment today, whatever it may be, if you're holding on to it, let it go. So one question that's come to my mind before when I've read this verse in Matthew where Jesus says that if you don't forgive, that your heavenly Father won't forgive you is, I've, I've had this thought, if I am not forgiving my brother or sister in Christ, is that a sign that I am not saved? Is that a sign that I, my sins have not been forgiven at all? You're not necessarily unsaved just because you harbor resentment or bitterness or unforgiveness towards someone. And, and the reason is because none of us are perfect. God understands that. There is grace for when we make mistakes. But what he means is that if we are holding on to unforgiveness toward our brother or sister in Christ, then we are not going to be able to receive the benefits of forgiveness here and now, the way that God has designed for us to receive them. So John 10.10 says, this is Jesus talking, he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. When he says, I came that they may have life, he's talking about salvation. He's talking about the eternal uh, reward for receiving Christ as our Lord and Savior. But when he says life and life more abundantly, or life to the full, some translations say, he's talking about the benefits of knowing God that we get to receive here and now on earth. So when we're harboring anger or resentment or bitterness in our hearts, anything that causes disunity, we're not going to be walking in the abundant life that Christ Jesus wants us to walk in. And instead, what's going to happen is what Paul, what, the same thing that Paul talked about in Ephesians 4, where he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. What he's talking about there, the thing that we're giving the devil an opportunity to do is, is the same thing that Jesus said in John 10.10. 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. When we are holding on to disunity, we are giving the devil an opportunity to steal, kill, and destroy in our lives in the areas that, that we are, are not willing to surrender to the Lord, the areas of disunity uh, that we're holding on to. And, and there are potentially a lot of those areas where, where we could be disunified. I mean, honestly, I think the devil will use anything he can use because he understands how important unity in the body of Christ is. I mean, think about it. He uses things like race, like denomination. He'll use background or even age, or, or what class we're in, he'll, he'll use anything he can use. Politics, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about something right now, he's speaking to me too, so don't, don't feel like I'm pointing the finger at you. I need to hear this message today. I mean, I think we all need to hear it. I think every single believer in the body of Christ needs to understand how important unity is. But if the Holy Spirit's working on a specific part of your life in your heart right now, if he's, if he's pointing things out to you, you need to understand that there is grace for you. The same way there's grace for me right now, there's grace for you right now. Let go of the hostility. Let go of, of whatever it may be that's causing the disunity and hold firmly onto the cross of Christ and accept the grace of God right now. So I want to quickly give you two ways that we can stay unified. The first is walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. In uh, verse 18, it says, Through Jesus we both have access through one Spirit to the Father. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. And then verse 22 says that God dwells in us through the Spirit. That God dwells in us as believers. So walking in the Spirit is so important to unity because not only does it does the Holy Spirit convict us when we are being dis, uh, you know, you know when we are breeding disunity when we're doing things to other believers we're not supposed to be doing, but He also enables us to respond in grace and love when they are mistreating us. And if you've never received the Holy Spirit, this is the perfect place to start right here. I want you to simply in prayer ask God and say, God, fill me with Your Holy Spirit. It's that simple. I believe that we all receive the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our hearts when we get saved because He begins to build in us a new creation, a new nature, 
um, the nature of Christ. But because of the words of Christ, I also believe we can receive uh, an even greater indwelling of the Holy Spirit when we ask in faith. Um, so if you've never asked for the, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I just encourage you to ask for that today. Um, number two, the second way that we can stay unified is to, to just surrender, to surrender it, whatever it is, surrender it to God. Whatever is causing the disunity, the anger, the resentment, the bitterness, whatever it is, give it to Him. When, whenever we open our hands to the Lord, maybe in worship or in prayer, it's a sign of surrender because we can't hold on to something. We can't keep it to ourselves and open our hands at the same time. When we open our hands, it falls at the feet of the Lord. I think some of us need to open our hearts today and we need to be honest with God and let Him see the things that has been causing the disunity. Be honest and say, God, I've not been forgiving this person or God, I have been angry at this person or whatever it may be. He's not gonna be scared of it. He already knows and He still loves you. And He still has grace for you today. Be honest with Him and surrender it. So I really hope you got something out of this today. I want to pray for you real fast, uh, and then I'm going to go. Lord Jesus, just thank You for what You've done for us on the cross. Thank You for loving us, God, so much that You wanted to bring us back into fellowship with You, even though none of us deserved it, Lord. I just ask right now that anyone who is watching this video, wherever they may be, God, that they would begin to experience a greater unity with fellow believers and and in the body of Christ than ever before. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey everyone, so I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to quickly remind you of two things. Number one, if you haven't checked out my Patreon page, go to patreon.com slash Troy Black. And this is just a place where if you enjoy my videos, and you want to give back and and help me to be able to keep creating videos like this, you can support me monthly on that page. And the second thing I want to remind you of is that on TroyBlackVideos.com, there's a place where you can go and book me to speak live at an event. Some events that I believe I'm a good fit for are Christian conferences, youth conferences, young adult conferences, and even Christian media conferences. And, And if there's another event that you think I would be a good fit for, Get on there, send me an email through the form, and and let me know about it, and and I will definitely prayerfully consider it. Um, So I love y'all, and I will see you later. God bless.